Have a look at these two pictures. Both were taken at the Vatican at a time of transition at the head of the Catholic Church. In 2005, after the death of Pope John Paul II, and then again in 2013, when Pope Benedict was succeeded by Pope Francis. What is stunning is how these two images make visible the groundbreaking change in media technology. They capture the sheer scale of the media revolution we've been going through over the last decade. By 2014, we were uploading an average of 1.8 billion pictures to Facebook, Flickr, Snapchat and WhatsApp. Not per year, not per month or week, but every single day. By the end of 2015, it was estimated that there were more mobile phones on the planet than people. That's at least one mobile phone for each and every one of us. Texting, tweeting, searching, emailing. And that's just the mobile phone. With what we now call the Internet of Things, more and more devices, now estimated to be something like 50 billion worldwide, are connected to each other and to the Internet. In 2016, Facebook announced that they had reached over 1.2 billion subscribers. If that were a country, it would make it the third largest on the planet behind China and India. Just within the space of a few short years, we have immersed ourselves in a hypermedia and information environment like none before. An environment that's surrounding us everywhere, all the time. But there's a real paradox today. Even though we are surrounded by so much information technology, we know so little about what happens beneath the surface of that technology. We tend to approach social media apps, information technology and cyberspace more generally in the way the science fiction author William Gibson first defined it. As a special kind of magic or, as he would say, a consensual hallucination. We've grown accustomed to use all of this technology in our daily lives, but we don't think much beyond the screens in front of us. Overcoming this lack of knowledge and thinking beyond the screens in front of us is actually paramount. It is paramount if we want to understand the role information technology has come to play, not only in our own social lives, but also how this very same technology is now intersecting with politics and particularly with war and violent conflict. And in order to show this, I would like us to imagine for a moment that we could undergo a metamorphosis, that we could transform ourselves into a software or hardware espionage program, that we could enter into the screen of our computer or tablet or mobile phone in front of us, that we could jump off and dive deep into the world of today's cyberspace. What would we discover? What would the politics of cyberspace we'd encounter look like? Most likely, we will discover a virtual space that in many ways offers greater freedoms and access to information than any generation before us. Take, for example, Wikipedia, a multilingual, web-based, free content encyclopedia that is based on a model of openly editable content. Since its creation in 2001, it has grown into one of the largest reference websites, attracting an average of 374 million unique visitors per month as of late 2015. Unlike printed encyclopedias, Wikipedia is a live collaboration, continually created and updated within minutes by average Internet users all across the globe. Cyberspace is also a powerful technology that connects people in new ways, as Jeff Jarvis points out.
I think it's important that when we make fun of young people for talking to their phone instead of the person in front of them, we forget that they're talking to a person here. So what you'll encounter in cyberspace is people. What the internet does is simply connect people to each other and to information. It also enables us to hear people in ways we couldn't hear them before. So right now in uh, America with the Trump election and the UK with Brexit and, and so on, there are frightening moments because we're hearing new voices. We're hearing voices that felt they were silenced for years and so they're louder. We're trying to negotiate new norms of civility and decency. We haven't gotten there yet, clearly. But at the end of the day, all you're doing is reaching the people of the world or those who are connected in new ways. And this ability to connect is oftentimes seen as having been instrumental in empowering people. For example, in Iran in 2009, protests following the presidential election were referred to as the Twitter revolution. Or the 2011 Arab Spring, sometimes dubbed the Facebook revolution, which saw a series of anti-government protests, uprising and armed rebellions that spread across the Middle East. Or take the Occupy Wall Street movement, a protest movement that began in September 2011 in Sikoti Park in New York's financial district that received global attention and that spawned a movement against economic inequality worldwide. Or Hong Kong in 2014 when students rose up in protest against changes to the Hong Kong electoral system. At first glance, all these examples show how cyberspace offers greater freedoms and access to information than any generation before. But very soon, we will also discover, virtually everywhere, a dramatic rise of forces that seek to curtail our access to information, that invade our privacy, and that seek to stifle the freedoms with which we have come to associate cyberspace. Looking beneath the surface of the digital screens reveals some disturbing trends towards worldwide patterns of internet censorship, global cyber espionage, and the growth of what experts call the market for digital arms. Products and services for surveillance, spyware, and computer network attacks. In other words, Cyberspace has changed into a politically contested space. And many of the initial freedoms of cyberspace and its capacities to liberate, emancipate, even democratize, have come under threat.